You don't own your video games. Welcome to Risky Bitness. I'm doing something a little different today. I'm talking about a controversial topic in the world of video games right now, game ownership. This channel mostly focuses on retro gaming, and that focus is very important to this topic. People like me who have been gaming since the 1980s seem to have a very different expectation of the way video games should work than younger gamers who started playing and purchasing video games within the last two console generations. We're used to purchasing a physical media and having the game. Buying video games simply doesn't work this way anymore. Now physical media seems to be slowly dying, while digital purchases and DLC are becoming the norm. On the other hand, I've been gaming on a PC since the 1990s, and I view digital purchases a lot differently because they've been an option for me for much longer. In order to really do this topic justice, I think the best approach is to do some digital rights myth-busting. Myth number one. Ownership of the physical media equals ownership of the game. This is false. It's in the end user license agreement of every piece of software, not just games. While EULAs can vary, one common thread they all seem to have is that when you purchase the disc, you aren't paying for the content on the disc. You're paying for a software license. That's why many games come with license keys or other forms of DRM. And even more scary, many of those EULAs state that this license can be revoked or terminated at any time. This can be a huge problem for people who buy gray market keys, as many of these keys are canceled by the publisher. So even though you have a key and you paid money for that key, you do not have a valid software license. The key is absolutely worthless, and the media itself is worthless without a valid license. On a personal note, I once purchased a copy of The Witcher for Windows, and that disc can no longer be used to install the game because the authentication servers have been taken offline. It simply can't be authenticated. The only way I was able to play the game was by purchasing a digital version on Steam. So in this particular case, the inverse of the myth actually proved to be true. However, this is not always the case. Digital distribution services like Steam can also revoke licenses or even go out of business entirely, leaving you unable to play any of the games you've purchased. Myth number two. Before the advent of digital distribution, ownership of the physical media equaled ownership of the game. This is also false. Even before storefronts like Steam and the Xbox and PlayStation stores became available, software has always had strict licensing rules, and they seldom would benefit the consumer. The big difference is that there weren't as many ways to enforce these rules. It was assumed at the time that if you had the physical media, that implied that you had a license to play the game simply because the publisher couldn't prove otherwise. This could be enforced to a point with the use of CD keys or requiring discs to be inserted into the console or PC in order for the game to be played. However, sharing and copying of both physical media and CD keys was common during this time, and household piracy was as mundane as copying cassettes or burning your friend a music CD. Myth number three, if I have the physical disc, I don't need an internet connection to play the game. The game is on the disc. This is also false. This comes back to my earlier comments about old school games. This was true up to the PS2, Xbox era, and is maybe even true of some games from the last two console generations, but definitely is not true of most of today's games. It also probably hasn't been true of PC games for much longer. How many times have you purchased a brand new game disc and popped it into your console, only to find that you had to download a large patch in order to even play the game? probably every time since 2006. This is because most games are sent to press in an incomplete or beta form. Publishers rely on day one patching to apply various fixes that were implemented in the last few days between manufacture and release. The game that is on the disc may be a completely unplayable mess or may not even boot up at all. With the PS4 slash XB1 generation, many games are much larger than what can be stored on a single disc. In previous generations, the solution was to release the game over multiple discs. 
Today it's much cheaper to just put some of the data on a disk and ship that, then have the rest of the data be downloaded by the user. Some game disks have very little data on them, and the bulk of the game is downloaded. Sometimes what is on the disk is not a playable game at all. Just metadata and a few core assets. That is all to say nothing of DLC. This content is saved to your local hard drive. Once you move to the next generation, it's gone. What all this means is that it doesn't matter if you have the physical media or not. If you can't reach the update servers, whether because they're taken offline or for any other reason, many, if not most of your games will not be playable. Myth number four. If I purchase a used game, I now own that game. This one can vary. However, many EULA stipulate that the license is non-transferable. In the past, this has been policed by logging IP addresses, which is very problematic because your public IP address can change. Imagine being unable to play a game because you moved or got a new router, even though you paid full price for that game. If you buy a used game, all you're buying is physical media. You are not buying a software license. Moreover, Publishers really don't want their games being sold used, handed down, or loaned, or given to a friend. That's money out of their pocket. Remember, the game publishers make zero dollars when you buy a used game from somebody or even a game store. Myth number five. Buying and selling used games does not hurt the publisher, but software piracy does. The final point may be the most controversial of all. Many gamers will purchase used games, but will condemn others for cracking a commercial release or downloading an illegal copy. Now, buying a game used may not be illegal, but it's certainly as unethical as downloading an unlicensed copy. Either way, the publisher of that game is not profiting from that sale. The people who worked on that game are not making any money on that sale. It's why buying and selling used games was illegal in Japan for many years. It's also the reason why Nintendo tried to kill game rentals, and even took Blockbuster Video to court. You might justify it because someone bought a copy of that game new, and at the time the publisher received their money. But the same is true of a pirated copy as well. It had to come from somewhere. And at some point, someone paid for it. So if you really want to shake your fist at someone for pirating games, go after the companies that sell devices preloaded with hundreds of unlicensed games. Those people are directly profiting off of someone else's intellectual property. They aren't sharing it or preserving it. They are selling it, and that's wrong. Regardless of what your feelings towards software piracy may be, or if you feel there's justification for doing it, the point I'm making here isn't that piracy is okay. The point is that the purchase and sale of used games is basically the same thing. I hope this puts to rest some of the myths and misconceptions that people have about games and the perceived ownership of those games. The sad fact is, you don't own any games you buy. Anything that predates the propagation of digital distribution is safe only because any license rules the publisher may have can't be enforced. But the future of collecting and keeping games for the PS3 and PS4 console generations and beyond is looking pretty bleak. If you like to purchase physical copies so you can have them in your collection, more power to you, but don't expect to actually be able to play them in 10 years. So for that reason, I'm probably not going to really bother buying any physical games anymore past the PS2 slash Xbox generation. It's just not worth it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate your time. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and enable notifications so that you never miss an episode of Risky Fitness. If you would really like to support the channel, please click on some of the links in the description. I get a little bit of money if you buy anything off of those links. And of course, I have a Patreon channel set up, link in the description for that as well. If you would like to support the channel directly, you will get access to every single episode no less than one week prior to YouTube, which is pretty cool. All that being said, thank you once again. You can follow me on social media, links in the description as well. Until next time, game over.